Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 64. Um, and we're, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Matthew Kotchit from La Trobe University. Thanks for your time, Matt. Massively, massively appreciated. And um, the topic of discussion is, is well, we're going to call it plant to heal pain, but I haven't actually spoken to Craig about this yet. But I know that when it comes to naming this episode, He'll probably want to call it plantar fasciitis because of this, because of, because he's a search engine optimization um, core, but, but you know, this is as good a place to start as any. And we're going to talk, we're going to, we, if time allows, we're going to talk about the massive amount of work you've published in the area of plantar heel pain, plantar fasciitis, plantar fasciopathy. Let, let's start with terminology because we all went to university and were taught it was plantar fasciitis. And then around 2003, Harvey Lamont published the paper in JAPMA that said, actually, we should be calling it fasciosis because there's no inflammation. And then we kind of all rolled with that. And then depending on our mood, we sometimes called it plantar fasciopathy because it sounded fancy. Um, and a bit like the tendonitis, tendinopathy discussion that, that come, goes back and forth as well. Uh, where are we currently at? Because it was 2017 that, that Henrik Real, yourself and a couple of others published the editorial in the BJSM, uh, sort of talking about, or you know, calling for, you know, just a, a bit more of an appropriate term um, for what we call this. Could you just give us a bit of a backstory to how the editorial came about and where, where your current thoughts are at with regard to terminology? Yes, yeah, so Henrik, Henrik and his team at Oldberg University were approached and then they approached us. And there was a few people scattered across the world um, in regards to plant heel pain terminology. And clearly there's some ambiguity and there's some inconsistency in the terminology used. So we're hearing well, every second RCT that you pick up, you'll, you'll see a different term. Or if an article that I review, you get people that are really adamant that it must be called this and it must be called that. So plantar heel pain, plantar fasciitis, plantar fasciopathy, um, policeman's heel, subcalcaneal heel pain syndrome. Um, clearly, it's, it's really varied. And so the aim of the paper was to have a bit more consistency in the approach and the terminology essentially to enhance communication between clinicians, perhaps to increase shared decision-making with patients, and maybe have better um, targeted treatments if there was a more of a, a clearer diagnosis, particularly with a specific term. So our suggestion was, let's call it, or let's recommend the use of the term planned heel pain, unless there is a more specific reason for a health professional to call it something else. So, if imaging revealed that there was a, a fracture of the heel spur, well, then you might be able to call it, you might be able to provide a diagnosis around a fractured heel spur. Or if MR, MRI revealed thickening of the plantar fascia and nothing else, well, maybe you could call it plantar fasciitis or plantar fasciopathy. But clearly, with MRI, it's so sensitive that you're picking up on so many different things now. And in someone with persistent heel pain, you'll often see changes within the plantar fascia it might be fragmented, it might be degenerative, it might be swollen, there might be edema within the calcaneus, edema in perifascial structures, might be evidence of increased signal around the fat, fat pad or the heel pad. So we don't truly know where that noxious stimulus is. And of all those tissues, what is the most important? So we recommended the use of the term plantar heel pain unless someone was specifically sure that they had a diagnosis um, but still, I think that's still really unclear as well. Yeah, I, I recall when it first came out and sort of started going, you know, doing the rounds on, on social media and Twitter. And we all know social media is a bit of a mean, mean place anyway. Uh, one of the criticisms that, that a few people were saying was that, you know, we've, we've been fighting these umbrella terms like metatarsalgia and shin splints for so long and saying they're too... Uh, sort of groupy and, and, and vague and we should actually be looking for the diagnosis and, and a few people I don't know if you read this criticism as well were saying this felt like a step uh, backward in, in that regard what, what was your sort of uh, re retort to that? Well look I don't necessarily agree I, I, I understand yes it's an umbrella term and it might maybe enhance ambiguity again but do we truly know where that noxious stimulus is coming from? So a patient's presenting with persistent heel pain, imaging reveals multiple issues. How could a clinician possibly know that that noxious stimulus is in the plantar fascia or it's in the calcaneus, it's in the fat pad, it's around the first branch of the lateral plantar nerve, it's in abductor lucis, FTB, QP, who knows? 
So I think, I think the term needs to be general in that case, in this situation, until we more clearly know where that noxious stimulus is. Yeah. So I'm not sure we'll, we'll ever know, to be honest, and, and how you determine yeah. that. So I think there are remember, multiple, issues, multiple issues and multiple tissues. So I can't see I remember, um, sorry to drop. Uh, Carl Landorf came over to the UK, I think it was last year or the year before, and they presented some of his data about just how many people have um, calcaneal bone edema who've had, you know, persistent uh, plantar fascia symptoms. Mm. And that, that, you know, that was the first time I think the whole room were like, wow, it, it was a massive percentage. I think it was 80 yeah. or something, but um, um, which kind of speaks to what you're saying there, doesn't it? Yeah. So multiple issues and multiple tissues, but yes, calcaneal edema is more common in people with plantar heel pain as is a, a thickened um, and swollen plantar fascia. But it doesn't mean it's dictating the severity of someone's symptoms. You know, I'm convinced that none of these factors are associated with the severity of someone's pain. Yes, they're more common, but there are other factors that are responsible for someone's pain and severity of pain. Actually, and, just and, sorry, just on that, Matt, did, did you see that paper a week or so ago in JETMA on proximal plantar intrinsic tendinopathy? <laughs> I didn't. No, I haven't seen it. Like, yeah, I don't know. Look, it's, it's uh, look, it's just a pure theory piece, but it's it's you know proximal plantar intrinsic tendinopathy. Yeah. Um, as an alternative diagnosis that we may or may not be missing, they're not saying it exists. They're just saying that we're not giving any thought to it. But that fits in quite nicely as well. What's the where's the source of the pain? It could be an ins intrinsic muscle insertion or tendinopathy. Yeah. Oh, look, not, I think the, the, muscle, is, yeah. the, the, intrinsic, <laughs> the intrinsic musculature has probably been ignored. There's obviously been an overemphasis on the plantar fascia. It's easier to, it's easier mm. to evaluate from an ultrasound point of view. Um, but clearly there are, there are other issues that are going on. But whether that impacts uh, on, on, our, on your treatment, who knows? Does it really matter? Um, yeah. Once yeah. you're under stress, and you're still going to approach it in the, exactly the same way. Mm. Uh, to your sort of point there that that we don't know the the, the true things contributing to the, the complexity of pain kind of beautifully kind of links us into my personal favorite area of your work uh because of my own kind of it just tickles my own bias and that's all of your work that you've published in um in the field of the kind of psychological sort of factors that seem to be associated in in people with plantar heel pain mm. um so you know, depression, anxiety, stress, catastrophization, kinesophobia, you know, we want to talk about all of this kind of stuff, but for someone who is watching and perhaps is, uh, we, we get quite a lot of undergrads and new grads and perhaps they, they're in the UK at least been sort of sitting there thinking plantar heel pain is a mechanical problem with mechanical contributions to pain and thus mechanical solutions. Where do we start? You know, could you give us a bit of an introduction into how you got into this area thinking, you know, kind of like, well, hang on a minute. These are, these are non-mechanical things we're looking at here and there seem to be reasonable, you know, moderate associations. Yeah, I guess, I guess it ties in with what we just said. What has always intrigued me is that there are a number of factors associated with the likelihood of having your pain but none of these factors are actually associated with the severity of someone's symptoms. So what is it? Are they, is it potentially psychological factors that are moderating the severity of someone's um, experience? So over time, I've, I tend to now view or all patients with plantar heel pain through a broader biopsychosocial model. And that certainly doesn't underestimate the role of biomedical factors such as BMI, plantar fascial thickness, calcaneal edema, angle joint range, foot posture, calf strength, calf endurance, etc. But it highlights that psychological factors, particularly the patient's beliefs, their behaviours, their emotions, play a really, really important role in their experience of pain. And it's arguably these factors that are associated with um, that transition from an acute episode of plantar heel pain to the one that becomes more persistent. And it's these factors in other musculoskeletal conditions that are certainly associated with pain and pain-related disability. So I think we all need to view plantar heel pain and all musculoskeletal pain through a broad model and consider multiple factors that influence someone's experience of pain, not just the biomedical factors. Yeah. And catastrophization, kinesophobia, possibly terms that some of our listeners may not be super familiar with. Could you just kind of um, go back to basics and summarize what they are and also how you may 
um, how you may sort of uh, assess them clinically with, with someone in front of you. Yeah. So catastrophizing is a negative cognitive response to the experience of pain. And people that catastrophize tend to either ruminate, they might magnify the, the, the threat value of their symptoms, or they might have a sense of helplessness. So the rumination in a, in a clinic setting, you might have the patient come in and their thoughts are going around and around and around, and they're never really getting to a, a completed state. Um, they might be magnifying the threat value of their symptoms so that they come in and they sit down and they think there's something seriously wrong with their heel or they've had relatives that had a similar condition and they had surgery or they might have a tumor or they've got a fracture or infection um, or they might have a sense of helplessness and that's i think this is really common people sit down and the first thing they might say is well i don't think you can help me i've tried this this and that and i just, I just don't know what to do anymore so they're, they're frustrated um, so i think if you allow the patient to tell a story They've generally got a story to tell about their plantar heel pain. So in, in regards to catastrophizing, I'm looking for people that are beginning to ruminate, magnifying that threat value and have a sense of, of helplessness. Um, so that, I mean, those sorts of signs can alert you to that presence of catastrophizing. If you wanted to, you can go and assess it with a pain catastrophizing scale, which is a 13 item questionnaire, easy to administer takes about five minutes and you can get a clinical cutoff score if you want to. So we found that the clinical or the, the mean score for catastrophizing was 13 out of a possible score of 52. So it wasn't high by any means, but it was associated with pain. It was associated with first step pain. So you could issue that in clinic. And if a patient had a score of 30 or greater, it certainly highlights a really high level of catastrophizing. So even in our study where the score was only 12, yes, it's low, but it was still ex associated with their experience of pain and first step pain. So I think it's still worth considering it as a yellow flag in the assessment and something that might need to be addressed as part of the treatment. Um, in regards to kinesiophobia, it's just this irrational, debilitating fear of, of injury and or movement. And catastrophizing and kinesiophobia are definitely interrelated. They're both correlated and they fit into this model called the pain um, or the fear avoidance model of pain, which you might be familiar with, which I can run through with, with you if you like. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. So if we think about someone with plantar heel pain, they've got a noxious stimulus somewhere in the heel. Who knows, who knows where it is? But the patient experiences pain beneath the heel. Obviously, the brain's thought that that noxious stimulus is worthy of attention. Um, the brain produces pain and now they've got pain beneath the heel. So there's a couple of options for the patient in terms of their experience. They could, they could catastrophize their symptoms potentially. So they begin to ruminate, they begin to magnify that threat value. They might have a sense of helplessness, maybe based on past experiences. And it's that catastrophizing that may be pain related here. It's that pain-related fear that may then lead to avoidance of activities. Patients avoid the activity because they're in fear of more pain or re-injury. And it's that avoidance that's linked to reduced function, disability, symptoms of depression. And it's the symptoms of depression that then impact on pain again. So we have this cycle moving around and around um, that can often exist without that noxious stimulus as well. The other possibility is the patient doesn't catastrophize, they actually confront it and they have no fear of it. They get educated, they go and see yourself, they go and see the osteopath, they learn more about it. They don't avoid loading it. And over time, um, their symptoms tend to abate perhaps faster than, than someone that might catastrophize. Sounds very simple, but um, it's a model that fits really nicely to highlight this interrelationship between catastrophizing, kinesiophobia, depression, anxiety, stress, but also the biomedical factors as well and do you use any kind of scale for kinesophobia in clinic i know there's the tampa uh, scale is that something you use would someone come in with heel pain and they'd all get the the, the, the tampa scale of kinesophobia to score or perhaps if they'd only had it for six months plus or, or never well it becomes a time issue particularly in that initial consultation there's so many other factors that need to be addressed and particularly from an education point of view so 
what I'm looking for is I'm looking for yellow flags in that subjective assessment. Symptoms associated with depression, anxiety, stress, um, maladaptive beliefs and thoughts, looking for catastrophizing and kinesiophobia. And if, if it's there, yes, I can think about those outcome measures, but I generally won't introduce it in that initial consultation. There's just too many other things to, to address. Um, and I also think that education can probably target some of those factors as well without having to, um, without having to issue those outcome measures. But certainly people with persistent pain that are not responding to your standard treatments or a sustained period of time, I, I think those outcome measures become more relevant. Actually, Matt, I've just, got, I just, I've just been thinking about something while you've been speaking, and I, I, this is a question without notice, um, totally unrelated to plantar heel pain. Just be interested in a short comment from you. What about those patients with corns? And catastrophizing those, those, mm -hmm. you know, like, like, surely it applies to them as well. Uh, oh, I, I think so. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> like I've never, I've never thought about it myself before until now. Just listening to you talking about, it, I thought, well, you know, there's, there's more to it. Yeah, I mean, if we've got some maladaptive beliefs around the corn that, yeah, that can be addressed. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm not sure I give them the, the pain catastrophizing scale because <laughs> they're, they're what I've found particularly early on is that they're. Um, initial thoughts are, are you telling me this is in my head? <laughs> yeah. That, that's, that's yeah, the same. So I think if you're going to view plantar heel pain through a biopsychosocial model, it's got to be from the start. It can't be after three months of failed treatment um, yeah. through using a, a biomedical approach because if you view them through a biomedical lens and then three months down the track, you say, look, I think we need to address your thoughts and your mood and your anxiety levels, you're going to say, you, you think this is in my head, don't you? And yeah. then you've lost them. Yeah. Um, it, it, I think it's fascinating that when you look at the, the other, the, the, the musculoskeletal literature in general, most of it in the world of the back pain, mm -hmm. but the, the emerging themes that are sort of undeniable is that it's, it's sort of um, the longer symptoms persist for the less likely the pain is related to the tissues and the more the more likely the, the more pre prevalent the psychological factors um, and when we think about the timelines of of plantar heel pain they're often incredibly long and persistent like, like back pain are so when we look at back pain as this complex biopsychosocial phenomena that's never just been mechanical it makes absolute sense we should look at plantar heel pain in the same way it's almost surprising that we haven't we haven't thought you know thought to do this a lot lot sooner um on that note the the, the, the systematic review that was published last year albeit only five papers because it's you know a small and three of them were yours of course um uh, by by chris drake um found something really fascinating i'd love your your uh, take on uh, or if you think there's any explanation for this and it wasn't just the sort of confirmation that um catastrophization kinesophobia depression anxiety stress are associated with uh, the pain it suffered in in with people that people have when they have plantar heel pain but it was more the suggestion that there was poorer outcomes of shockwave therapy the greater the presence of these psychological factors. Could I get a, a, a sort of a comment from you on that? Any, any thoughts on that? Well, look, I, I suspect it would be the same for any intervention, any intervention. So if you look at the literature for other musculoskeletal conditions, particularly those with persistent lower back pain, knee pain, um, neck and hip pain, it's the factors that are associated with a poor prognosis. Generally, um, poor adherence to, to treatments, um, being a little bit more disengaged from the process, um, not getting involved in the active um, approach to their treatment. So I'm not sure shockwave stands out as being any different. I just think that these psychological factors are associated with poor problems, irrespective of what intervention is implemented. I think just a lot of these factors just interfere with someone's adherence and compliance to interventions yeah interesting do you think you think the same would apply to foot orthoses for example i know some of your colleagues at latrobe uh, glenn whitaker has done just finished his phd in that in that area is there any any sort of discussions you and he have had in, in along these lines uh not specifically related to um 
plantar heel pain, not specifically related to orthoses, but the issue with a lot of the research that I've done is it's cross-sectional in nature. So we're just getting a snapshot right here and right mm -hmm. now. My, my interest is in these longitudinal associations between um, psychological factors and pain and function, but also the impact that these factors have at baseline on outcomes in the long term. So what I really want to do is some longitudinal studies. Clearly they're time consuming, expensive to run, but they're far more powerful and we can make greater inferences from the data um, if we do it. But I suspect that these factors and in, in the foot and ankle would be no different from other parts of the body. I can't see why they wouldn't be also be associated with poorer prognosis in the long term, irrespective of the intervention that's implemented. Cool. So a little, little tease into some of the work we can uh, get excited about seeing from you in uh, future years there, which is great. Um, let's move on to um, the area that, where you, you did your own PhD, which was again plantar heel pain, but it, but it was in um, dry needling. I want to touch on this for a couple of reasons. Firstly, just to you know, talk about kind of um, what your data showed. And then secondly, obviously, to talk about the fact that, that for whatever reason, this feels like a, a bit of a... Uh, a controversial topic this particular topic is one of you know like, like any passive i think modality now particularly certain groups of physios um get 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 a bit fighty when they when they hear it about it so first of all let's just start by giving you the opportunity to say what what your your research was and what it showed if that's okay yeah so it was part of my phd and i i mean i i did the phd because i wanted to stay in academia and i chose plantar heel pain because my supervisor's I was an expert in plantar heel pain and around that time I had an interest in needling so I thought well we'll put it all together but my true interest <laughs> was in depression anxiety and stress um, which is one of the secondary outcomes that I used in the trial so we evaluated real dry needling versus sham dry needling and its impact on pain and function and depression and anxiety and stress over a over the short term over a 12-week period so um, participants were randomised to either real or to sham. The sham needle was a blunted serin acupuncture needle. I chopped the tip off it, I put it into a vise, polished it, make sure it was rounded, um, put it into an electron microscopy machine just to make sure it was rounded and wasn't going to penetrate the skin. And then for all participants in both groups, I looked for and tried to identify my facial trigger points particularly in specific structures that are, are commonly associated with plantar heel pain. So gastroc, soleus, quadratus plantae, abductor, pollusis. So I try to identify the myofascial trigger points, identify the taut band. In the real group, I performed real needling. So the needle was advanced through the skin, through the superficial fascia into the muscle. And for the sham group, I palpated the myofascial trigger point, pretended to tap it, I tapped it, prevent, pretended to insert it, pretended to manipulate it, and then pretended to leave it in situ for five minutes. And then after five minutes, I would remove the reel in the sharps container for the sham group, pretend to remove it, put it into the sharps container. So it had all the theatre around a, a reel consultation. So we found that after 12 weeks, reel was superior to sham statistically, but it wasn't clinically meaningful. So the minimal important difference for someone with plantar heel pain, the value that's considered clinically meaningful to them is about 18 millimetres on a visual analogue scale. So we found that the difference was about 14 millimetres between the two groups. So both groups improved, but clinically there was no difference between those two groups. Um, I got criticised a lot for the use of the sham in that many people thought the sham was an active treatment, which potentially it is to have a blunted acupuncture needle tapped up and down on your skin for a period of 30 seconds wasn't actually that comfortable for some people. So their brain was receiving a stimulus. So I actually viewed the sham as probably a treatment rather than a true sham or a, a placebo. Um, so there, there, were, there was certainly some criticism as you, as you mentioned pre, um, um, podcast today and it, it centered around being too specific with the model that I used. So a needling was guided by the myofascial trigger point model. Some people believe I should, should have used other models to guide my use of 
of needling, not just needle myofascial trigger points, but perhaps needle fascial structures, perhaps some periosteal pecking. Um, and some people are very critical of the, re the reliability around myofascial trigger point palpation. And that, that's certainly a contentious issue. I understand the issues. Do we truly know that that needle is in the myofascial trigger point? We don't really know. Do I truly know that I was in QP? Maybe, maybe not. So some people were critical of how do you truly know you're in the muscles that you thought you were needling? Um, and yeah, look, that were the major issues. And can, I guess overall, it wasn't a huge difference between the two groups either. Can I just, can I just ask Matt, based on that study, which Dave actually read for a few years and subsequent work, what, what are you feelings now about dry needling and the evidence for, on plantar heel pain? Um, look, it's not strong. Mm. It, it certainly shouldn't be used as a first-line treatment for, mm -hmm. for plantar heel pain. It's an adjunct treatment, and that's come out in our clinical practice guideline as well. Mm. Um, certainly not first-line, maybe as an adjunct. My, my belief is, and some, and some people might agree with this, is that the context in which the needle delivered is more powerful than the needle itself. So the non-specific contextual effects, I think are more powerful than whatever specific effect it's having on the local tissue or on the, on the brain. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, um, Steve Novella, who's a neurologist who writes a science-based medicine blog, he, he coined the term theatrical placebo. Yeah. And, and that's pretty paper. much what you're saying. And, and uh, it's, it's, um, just, just on the, the, the whole, this whole issue, and it's sort of, you know, the, the, the comment made earlier on that, you know, that plantar fasciitis is a mechanical problem, needs mechanical solutions. Um, the discussion we've just had about um, catastrophizing, kinesiophobia, anxiety, all those kinds of issues. How do you think the dry needling might actually work? Because it, 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 I've always struggled to think you've got a bit of damage in a tissue here, the plantar fascia, let's ignore all the other issues, and you're sticking needles up here. How does that affect that degeneration? Now, I'm not denying the evidence, and, and I, I, I think I know the answer, but I'd rather, you know, how do you think it actually helps? Well, I don't think it changes the tissue at all. Yeah. <laughs> no, <that's, yeah. laughs> um, I think it works because it hurts. Yeah. And I think perhaps for a similar reason, shockwave might work. I think shockwave works because it probably hurts. And then you might be activating specific areas of the brain mm -hmm. that are involved in descending pain control. So you're getting suppression of that noxious stimulus in response to something that, that, that really hurts. But there are some forms of dry needling and there are some forms of acupuncture that don't hurt. But people seem to have a positive outcome. So why is it, why might they be improving? And is it due to their reward system? So areas of the brain associated with that reward system if a patient goes in with positive expectations of improvement and a positive outcome and the clinician is in favor of that particular treatment and really sell it i think that's probably why they're having a good outcome so i don't, I don't think the needle has any specific effect I mean, it might have a specific effect but i think it's the context in which it's delivered and the fact that it probably hurts that might be responsible for outcomes yeah, I think that thought process is, could be quite applicable to quite a wide range of treatments for some other pathologies as well. Um, yeah, but I also think for all the other interventions we implement for plantar heel pain, whether it's orthoses, stretching, tape, shockwave, mm -hmm. I think it's the context in which all these interventions are delivered that are more powerful than the specific effect. Yeah. Because the specific yeah. effect of all the interventions that are evaluated, the effect size is small. Mm -hmm. for, the, for almost all of them, shockwave is a little bit different perhaps but the shockwave data is really inconsistent too. So clearly there's something else going on that we're missing. And I think it's the contextual effects. Yeah, yeah the theatrical placebo. <laughs> yeah. So uh, now, now, now feels like a good time just before we get, um, get into talking about best practice. Um, you know, you've kind of touched on some of the interventions there. I want to talk about the, the evidence for them and the, the kind of massive bit of work that you're doing at the moment, Matt. Um, but now feels like a good time, just before we do, Craig, for, to do your little bit about our uh, our sellout, <laughs> our, um, our shout out for Hamish's fasciitis Pfizer and the, the competition we're running that you can enter. Here they are. I don't know if you, everyone's probably familiar with them. Um, 
Except you can win. How many is Hamish giving away? Did he say two? <laughs> I think it was two, right. but um, let's right. just... well, it's two. It's two now. It's two now. Um, yeah. So if you want to be in the draw to win um, two fasciitis fighters, I'll just I'll share the link in a moment. This is our giveaway page. You've got five days left to enter. You need to either just use your email or log in with Facebook. And there are one to six different things here that you can do. Um, and you get one entry for each of these things that you do. So you can potentially get six entries to be in the draw to win a fasciitis fighter. Um, so I'll just post that link now. It's open for five days, so I might share it again next week before it closes. There we go. And so if you are entering to win, if you are entering to win one of these, which is essentially to help your patients sort of work on various strength uh, deficits for their plantar heel pain. Um, we were, we're about to talk about the evidence for it. Or, or, <laughs> lack, <laughs> lack of, uh, God, God, I hope Hamish isn't watching, but uh, thanks for the t-shirt, Hamish. It fits like a dream. Um, yeah, mine, mine fits too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, and if you're, if you're a company that um, wants to give us free stuff, and in, in turn, give away free stuff to our audience. Uh, our episode next month is, uh, I think, the second or third Thursday of December. So you need to get in touch with us in the next couple of weeks. But back on track, selling out aside, let's talk about this massive bit of work that you're, you're sort of one of the kind of lead, leads on, Matt, this best, best practice guide for plantar heel pain, which is just going to be massive. And um, people may be familiar with a similar guide already out there on um, patellofemoral pain which essentially took, you know, ran a, a systematic review with all the, you know, did, looked at all of the evidence, then asked all, you know, interviewed all of the world leading experts that treat uh, patellofemoral pain and asked them what they do. And then took a group of, of patients, you know, sufferers and, and asked them what was important to them and, and brought it all together. And it was a massive, lovely bit of work. And you're doing the same in plantar heel pain as well. So could you tell us a bit about it, please? And you're involved too, Ian. <laughs> yeah, I am. yeah I, i'm down like sixth or seventh author so it barely counts you're up you're right at the top there so you go for it <laughs> so as you pointed out it's it's a clinical practice guideline very similar to the patellofemoral one and it's designed to synthesize i guess the three pillars of best practice the best available evidence expert opinion and clinical reasoning with the voice of the patient and for plantar heel pain i think the voice of the patient has been totally lost it just hasn't been evaluated and I just submitted a publication yesterday on the lived experience of people with plantar heel pain and their educational needs, but that's a side issue. Um, so the clinical practice guideline is a synthesis between all those three factors. So we evaluated all the evidence, conservative and surgical, for plantar heel pain. To get into the study, a study needed to meet really strict quality criteria in terms of um, internal validity and risk of bias. And I know you're certainly involved in that process, Ian, and it's still going. Um, <laughs> but Dylan also came up with a great rule for when is it an intervention truly considered effective? And the rule is a study was an intervention was considered effective if it came from an RCT with a minimum sample size of 38 per group, and the inter intervention was found to be superior to a sham or placebo, or intervention was found to be superior to a treatment of known efficacy. And we also looked at the strength of the evidence, whether it was strong, moderate, or limited. Then that was synthesized with expert opinions. So experts around the world, from England, Denmark, Australia, America, were interviewed about their clinical reasoning and judgments and their perceptions of the evidence, gaps in, in their literature as well. Um, and patients were also surveyed, 40 patients, about their lived experience and strengths of management, weaknesses, areas for improvement. And essentially, all that information was synthesised to develop a core approach to plantar heel pain. And that core approach consists of a suite of different interventions. It included the evidence-based intervention of plantar fascial stretching in combination with foot taping, and a very, very individualized approach to education. And the education folk focused around um, encouraging the patient to modify their load, whether it's standing, whether it's dynamic, the, the frequency, the type, the level of activity. It also focused on a lot of education around pain and addressing any maladaptive beliefs and allaying fears around their experience of pain and highlighting factors that might be associated with pain as well. 
there's a big focus on footwear, making sure footwear was socially acceptable. But a lot of people talked about the importance of a, a very slight rear foot to four foot drop on the heel and making sure the shoe was comfortable. Education around long-term conditions that are really common in people with plantar heel pain like diabetes, maybe inflammatory arthropathies that are in the, in the background. So the core approach was this basic approach that um, forms a framework for managing someone with plantar heel pain based around the best evidence, expert opinion, and what the patient wants. So that was taping, stretching, and education being perhaps the most important component of that core approach. And then depending on progress over the next sort of six week period, um, a, the patient and clinician could consider a stepped up approach. So they could consider the next, um, uh, I guess, the next intervention um, around shockwave therapy in particular, custom foot orthoses as the next option. Um, and then depending on progress beyond that, maybe thinking about injections. So, we had a core approach and then a stepped approach, stepped care approach, including shockwave and customer policies and then injection therapies beyond that. I think what, I don't know what your, your thoughts were. But I remember when I first saw the data, I think what might surprise a few people is the order of that approach. Certainly, you know, when, I don't know how it is in Australia, but in the UK, people, gen, I mean, shockwave comes a lot earlier in that, in that stepped approach, I think, than, than it's probably being currently applied in, in the real world. Mm. Uh, and I guess if people, if people have a shockwave machine, that will please them. Um, but um, also sh injections come a little bit later. I think in the UK, we tend to generally go injection before shockwave. Mm. And uh, I think the other thing that, that was interesting to me was how custom-made orthoses uh, came out a bit superior to prefabricated, mm. which... Um, in almost every single paper that we <laughs> that, that, that we read is, is is always telling us they're no better that they're, they're no superior so i think they're the things i mean you know let's take you know when you published your dry needling paper and then you got a load of stick for it you know you've published enough to know that um you're going to get some pushback on certain points what, what's your thoughts when this paper eventually sees the light of day about some of the comments you think you may get what do you think people are going to like and dislike about this I think they might like the prescriptive nature of it. It does provide them some guidance and it's, and it's guidance provided by what the patient wants and what clinicians are doing in practice and what the evidence actually tells us. So it's not like we've made it up. It's natural <laughs> synthesis of the three pillars. So I, look, I do agree that shockwave could come a lot earlier in some situations. If the patient has a really strong belief for shockwave and You've got the unit there well, why not use it um, or if you've got someone that's got an event coming up in three or four weeks time and you want to knock symptoms on the head really quickly or get some relief well an injection might be more appropriate at that point in time um, I guess the focus was on in the beginning in that first step implementing a, a program that can be undertaken by the patient easily at home is generally cost-effective as well um, and then looking at in the next step, um, items like shockwave and custom orthosis is obviously more expensive. There might be issues to accessibility, but if if any of those other treatments on different levels need to be introduced earlier, I, I don't see any reason why they why they shouldn't be. Particularly if the patient has strong beliefs and expectations around it, there'd be nothing worse for the patient coming in saying they want shockwave, but you say no. Nah, look, I'm going to stick to the core approach, and I, want, I just want you to stretch. And we're just going to tape and I'm just going to educate you about psychological factors. So we need to, we need to um, consider what the patient's preferences are and expectations and be guided by that. Yeah. And let's talk about, um, not the elephant in the room per se, and this isn't a dig at, at this guy here. It's, we're talking about strength in general. We know, we know from speaking to colleagues and also from, from some of the expert uh, opinion uh, interview things that, um, that strength is 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 favoured quite strongly, you know, and what that what what we, we find it lacking in is uh, the patients weren't particularly expecting of it. Uh, they didn't believe necessarily that was what they needed, and also the evidence um, currently isn't well. Certainly, there was there wasn't a single paper from memory strong enough to be included in in uh, this review, was there? So, um, why are clinicians banging the drum about sort of strength being so important when um, 
when the other two pillars don't seem to be speaking to that? Yeah, I think, um, I guess perhaps some of the earlier research, particularly around 2014, where the, the trial that looked at that loading program was very favourable for, um, for pain uh, and people with plantar heel pain. But in our analysis, it, it didn't make the cutoff in terms of the quality score. So I think people were really enticed by the result initially. Um, and I think there were some people in the UK that were very, very forthright about it and really pushed it. And I think people were just looking for that intervention similar to a loading program for Achilles tendinopathy that could easily implement. They've got a prescription. They, they load the tissue in a certain manner. Um, and let's see how you go. Um, but clearly the evidence isn't strong enough for the strength-based program. There was one study that just made it and it was a study by Johansson and they compared strengthening to corticosteroid to corticosteroid plus strengthening. And they found that corticosteroid plus strengthening was superior to corticosteroid on its own. Actually, just, just on that, Matt, the, I, I, you know, and I, plus I can't recall the author, but there was that study that just showed there was a strength deficit in those with plantar, pass, plantar heel pain. Yep. So therefore, shouldn't it make logical sense that we should include some rehab, whether that was a chicken or egg issue? Mm. If the muscles are weaker, shouldn't we include some rehab? Potentially. I mean, I'm, I'm mindful that they're all cross-section studies too. Yeah. So, you know, which ones come first? The pain yeah. lead, the deficit in strength or vice versa. Um, but there was real tension in the data, in, particularly in, with the experts that were interviewed. Some were very pro and some were just really, really unsure based on their own experience of not getting good outcomes. Yeah. Oh, I so, think th there's certainly a huge element of drinking the Kool-Aid around some of the approaches to plantar heel pain. Yeah. Um, without actually looking critically at, at the, the protocols that we use in the study and, and uh, those kinds of issues. So I, I, think, I think the guide might get criticised for that lack of exercise approach, mm. that mm. Where, is, where is the strength-based um, where does the strength-based program sit in this core approach or in addition to the mm. core approach? But clearly the evidence doesn't support it. It's just not strong mm. enough. It's very uncertain. Experts around the world were very uncertain and there was a lot of conflict and a lot of tension between um, experts and patients didn't talk about it either. They didn't talk about getting favourable results with it and many people just didn't mention it. So they were talking more about orthoses, taping, stretching, shockwave, injections. Strength-based programs weren't being mentioned so we, we can't ignore that and mm. so... That guideline is just yeah. a guide. I think it's going to be interesting to see the comments when, when it sees the light of day. I say when, you know, when Dylan first got me on this project I, and I said, oh, you know, I've got loads on at the moment. He's like, literally, this is a one year project, Max. And we are now in year three, aren't we, Matt? Is it the third? Yeah, yeah. Just, I spoke to him in, I, came <laughs> in, I think March 2016. He said, we'll have this number. <laughs> 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 yeah, but I know that was, that was how he got me. It will be well, submitted but... before Christmas this year, Ian. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, Craig, before we, I'm just looking at the time. Before we wrap up, I just want to summarise and give people some clinical take homes. So how do we get all this together, and how does it help someone in clinic tomorrow morning? Before then, any questions on the no, Facebook? Yeah, no, um, we've only just had one one question or more of a comment type question from Graham, and I, it, it is actually interesting. I just. Um, if you get an obviously depressed patient with plantar heel pain, are we on a loser? No, definitely not. And that's a, it's a really good point. Mm. There's the different scales that someone can use in their practice. You could use like the depression, anxiety and stress scale, the short version, the 21, which has seven items for depression, anxiety and stress. The, the designers of the DAS have clinical cutoffs. So if someone came out with... Um, severe or highly severe symptoms of depression, anxiety and stress. It certainly doesn't mean that they're going to have a poor outcome. And it certainly doesn't even mean that it might be associated with their experience of, of pain. But I think what it highlights is that um, the patient is in distress and they need assistance either from the GP or the psychologist and highlight to the patient, yes, this might be a factor that's interrelated with what, what you're experiencing, but do not for a second think that they're going to have a poorer outcome because of it. 
But just I've got a quick. I've got a quick question that actually has just come to mind. But bit of bit of bit of bit of a just a intentionally controversial one, devil's advocate one. But given what we know about plantar heel pain and the lack potential lack of correlation with the tissue status of pain and the persistence of the uh, the length of the symptoms and how that you know means more prevalence of psychological variables and how psychological variables then complicate pain. Who do you think? Uh, all other things being equal, would get a better outcome is someone with real persistent, long-standing heel pain, a podiatrist or a psychologist? Mm. <laughs> well, this is, this is actually a nasty thing I want to set up. Have that would be lovely, treatment, wouldn't it? Plus standard treatment with CBT or ACT or mindfulness. Look, I, I suspect the combination of the two would be superior to a pure um, biomedical approach. And the, the evidence is, is pretty, well, it's, it's medium in nature for a combination approach being superior to a pure biomedical approach for other musculoskeletal conditions. The issue will become cost, I think. Is it economically viable for the patient to go through the biomedical approach with the pod plus 10 sessions with the psychologist as well? Or can the podiatrist provide education around some of these factors? That might be sufficient enough but i'm also mindful too that a well-prescribed orthotic might actually impact on their mood too oh. so um yes we can think about these psychological factors being associated with their pain and education and maybe cbt and mindfulness being important but maybe just addressing it from a biomedical point of view too can impact on their psychology and their self yeah. Um, yeah yeah I need to talk to you, remind me, I need to talk to you about something offline in that exact note for my own postgrad studies as well. But let's, let's try and wrap this up then because we're getting towards the hour. So we're all, you know, we've got audience of podiatrists listening. They're probably in clinic tomorrow, if not certainly uh, on Monday uh, morning here in the UK. Plantar heel pain is one of the most common things we see, uh, you know, I would guess, uh, regardless of where we are geographically. So have all of the things we've discussed, the weight of the evidence, the science of the day, 2019, what are the kind of take homes with regard to clinicians who are going to be seeing heel pain? What, what kit do they need in their clinic? What tools do they need in their toolbox? What things or should they be doing in their assessment? What things should they be saying in their, in their history taking? Yeah. Well, this might be a little bit controversial, but I think, I think we just need to consider the beliefs and the preferences and the judgments and the evaluations of the patient. So I don't think you're a, a person's assessment of someone with plantar heel pain should change dramatically. I suspect my approach is very similar to, to most people, but I'm probably focusing more on, okay, what is the impact of this condition on you physically, but also what's the impact on the patient's emotions and um, what's the impact on the patient's thoughts and ask them a lot about, okay, what are your thoughts on the pathology? What are your thoughts on the cause? What are your thoughts on the prognosis? What are your thoughts on the treatment? What are your preferences? What do you want to do? Clearly what's come out a lot of, clearly what's come out of a lot of the research is patients are unsure about expectations and prognosis. So I think that needs to be addressed as part of the assessment. So focusing on emotional health, Focusing on their thought processes and beliefs is really important, I think, in that subjective evaluation. And what I'm thinking as I'm going through that is, is this issue an issue relating to nociception? So just an issue relating to um, damage of tissue? Is it a neuropathic issue? So is there a neuropathic lesion? Or is it potentially nociplastic? So is there some, an element of central sensitization perhaps? Are there psychological factors or yellow flags in the background that might be responsible for their experience of, of pain? And once I know, once I think I know which category a patient falls into, is it purely nociceptive or neuropathic, then I'll just treat them through a biomedical model. Stretching, taping, the core approach we just talked about. Um, if it's nociplastic, then we need to view the patient through a broader biopsychosocial model and think about these psychological factors that, that might be relevant. Um, and if that's the case, we might need to address those factors separately. So view the patient through a biopsychosocial model, but not every patient needs to be treated through it. Um, I guess that clinical practice guideline highlights a suite of different interventions that 
should be perhaps um, implemented from the beginning, but education becomes the core part of that approach in education that is really individualized to the patient, but then consider a stepped care approach and think about those evidence-based interventions beyond the core approach like orthosis and shockwave, maybe injections um, that can help someone that is plateaued um, or it's just not improving. Perfect. So yeah. if you're out there and you're listening and you're seeing an awful lot of heel pain and perhaps frustrated with it, not getting as good results, the key thing here is make sure you're taking a biopsychosocial approach and keep an eye out for our paper, which is hopefully going to be in print in 20, early 2020, right? Is that, is that, that's a pretty, pretty uh, kind of real quick sort of post-it summary. View the patient through a broad model. Don't be, don't be too narrow and, and focus pure on the biomed biomedical. And irrespective of whether the patient has symptoms for one week or six months, they, I think they need to be viewed through a broader model from the start. Don't introduce the model three months down the track after treatment has failed because the, I think you'll lose the patient. Well, that's my experience. Um, and they'll think that you're telling them that everything's in their head. Um, yeah. So look for yellow flags, symptoms of depression, symptoms of anxiety, symptoms of stress, people that are ruminating, people that have a sense of helplessness because uh, it's these factors that are arguably responsible for that transition from an acute episode to one that's becoming more persistent. And I think they need to be identified really, really early on, not six months down the track after treatment is, is failing. So probably go away, think about incorporating that into the assessment, but perhaps learn a little bit more about each of these factors and their association with poor outcomes, their association with pain, pain-related disability. Um, but don't get too caught up in it either. I've been really <laughs> of overemphasizing the psychological component and ignoring the biomedical elements. They can't be separated. They're very much interlinked in yeah. assessment and treatment. Perfect. I feel like Craig, most of our episodes, whatever we're talking about, really come back to take a good history, understand pain, adopt a biopsychosocial approach. It really doesn't seem to matter what we're talking about anymore. Mm -hmm. These are our kind of take homes, but, um, are we going to link to all of them, all of the papers we've referred to, all of Matt's I've, papers? I've linked them as we've gone through, yeah. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. Anything else on the Facebook or do you want no, to No, that was there? it. No, no, no real, no, just apart from Graham's question, that's the only question we got. So um, I think people Same have point. been so engrossed in taking it all in. Um, so look, thank, thanks so much, Matt. Thanks, Craig. Um, it's been good. So thanks, Ian. Thanks, Matt. Really appreciate that. Thanks, uh...